I recently just finished this book. It's called Dirty War, Rhodesia and the Chemical Biological Warfare, 1975 to 1980. And being a lover of the study of history and of the study of infectious diseases, uh, this made uh, for a pretty good read. I'd like to introduce Dr. Glenn Cross, who after 18 years looking at the use of chemical and biological agents in Rhodesia, recently has written the first book to thoroughly look at the at this important topic. Dr. Cross has spent almost all of his long professional life looking at the chemical and biological weapons issues involving nation states and terrorist organizations. Dr. Cross, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you, Robert. I'm pleased to be here and talk about uh, events in Rhodesia. Excellent. It was a very good book. I want to uh, put that out there right now, give you the props. Um, well, thank you. Sure. And um, l- let's start out and give a, a, a little bit of a, a primer to the audience. Um, it's, I mean, we know how oh. ge- geography is uh, taught in school these days. <laughs> so where is Rhodesia? And can, okay. And can you give a little history of of that situation? Uh, certainly. First, let me say that my comments are my own, and they do not represent the positions of any of my employers, past or present. But let's dig into where Rhodesia is. So to answer your first question, mm-hmm. it's in southern Africa, and it's currently named Zimbabwe ever since its independence in April 1980. It's at about the same land size as Montana. It's landlocked, and it's bordered on the east and north by Mozambique, on the northwest by Zambia, the southwest by Botswana, and to the south by South Africa. Um, originally, it was a British proprietary colony founded in 1890, and it was governed by a corporation, not by the British government. Um, the corporation that owned uh, Rhodesia was the British South Africa Company, which governed um, the colony from its foundation until 1923, when there was a referendum and the populace was given several options, and it elected to become a self-governing British colony. And it's a, in that sense, it was very different from other British colonies in that it was completely self-governing and self-financing. It had a royal governor, but all its internal affairs um, were ruled within the, the colony itself, and it was self-financing from its own taxes. It wasn't dependent on the British government. So... Um, that all changed after World War, to- World War II when um, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan gave his winds of change speech in 1960, and Britain, Britain began to decolonize Southern Africa. Uh, the Rhodesian government, given its unique status, um, believed that it would, it would rule uh, independently from Britain when, when independence was granted, that the existing Rhodesian government would just take the reins from the UK. Um, however, Britain insisted uh, on arrangements for majority rule. They wanted to transfer power in some form or through some mechanism to the black population. So after five years of talks uh, between London and the Rhodesians in their capital, Salisbury, Rhodesia declared its unilateral independence, sparking an insurgency that would last until late uh, 1979. So that sort of that gives you the geographical context and some of the political context. Yeah, and in, in, in piggybacking on the political context, um, there was a, you know most of Africa was colonized by some European country at one time. Can you talk a little bit about the political climate in Africa from say the late fifties through the sixties? Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Things dramatically changed in 1960 with the Winds of Change speech, which Macmillan gave uh, in the South African Parliament. And that basically heralded um, Britain's determination to grant independence to a whole host of um, colonies. And for the most part, independence went more or less smoothly, unlike unlike some of the other colonial powers, notably Belgium. Um, but things were very different in Rhodesia in the sense that it had a a small white minority government. There were about 200, no more than 250,000 whites uh, at the height. 
and about 7 million uh, Native African um, population. Um, Rhodesia, however, had a living standard probably akin to that of, at the time, Italy or some of the other uh, European states. I uh, had a well-developed educational system, uh, medical system, road, infrastructure. Um, so it was one of the more developed of the British uh, African colonies. Um, and it had one of the higher standards of living. And uh, even to today, it has one of the higher educational literacy standards. Um, so Rhodesia was, was quite different. Um, with Macmillan's winds of change speech, uh, African political parties began to spring up within Rhodesia, arguing, you know, and trying to prepare for a gradual transition to majority rule. Um, most of these efforts were outlawed by the Rhodesians and forced into exile and later became the political basis for the insurgency. Um, is that enough of a background? To yeah, yeah, that's, that? yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, so, so your book covers 1975 to 1980. Um, and you document in the book the use of biological chemical weapons during the conflict, the Rhodesian conflict. Um, who was using the biological chemical weapons and what were some of the agents that were used and how were they used? Okay. So um, th there's a whole prelude to, to why they were used, which is how the, the war uh, evolved. But the um, the Rhodesians had a, had a wish list. They, they basically were looking at readily available industrial and agricultural chemicals, the stuff they had in hand. They were operating under an embargo. Uh, few nations legally traded with the Rhodesians. Um, the Portuguese would, and so would the South Africans, and they had illegal sanctions busting, because they were under UN sanctions, they had uh, illegal sanctions busting efforts as well. Um, so they largely relied on what they could either import from South Africa or they had on hand you know, readily. Um, so for the, the chemical portion of the effort, it was largely the organophosphate pesticide uh, parathion, and that was used to contaminate um, clothing, largely undergarments, underpants, hats. Um, for the for food and beverages, it was largely thallium, and that was used to contaminate um, canned meats. And um, they used micro needles to insert it into cans and into bottled beverages. Um, for the biological agents, um, ever since 1972, there had been a widespread use of um, cholera, largely in water supplies, standing water supplies, wells, cisterns, pans um, in Mozambique, and that was largely to create um, killing zones so that gorillas would be forced through through these killing zones uh, through these areas into killing zones within Rhodesia, where the Rhodesian uh, security forces could effectively. Uh, eliminate those those groups of entering insurgents. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to go into some of the background as to why they used and why they felt necessary. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, how did it get to this point? And, and how did nobody seem to know about this? <laughs> and, okay. <laughs> you know, okay. And, until this book. <laughs> so... Um, Let's go back and give it because, because if this was hap story. if this was happening right now, Doctor Cross, every, yeah. everybody would be jumping on it. Uh, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, and we can go talk about some of those issues as well. But okay, so with the unilateral declaration of independence in in 1965, the insurgency continued at a low level for many years. The insurgents' forces were few, they're poorly trained, poorly equipped, clearly clearly outmatched by the Rhodesian security forces. Um, the insurgents basically were broken into two groups, largely split along ethnic lines. Um, one group was the African, uh, sorry, the Zimbabwe African Liberation, National Liberation Army, or ZANLA, and that was drawn from the largest Rhodesian group, the Shona. The other group was the Zimbabwe People's Revolutionary Army, or ZIPRA, and it was made up of a minority ethnic group, the Matabili. Um, 
The Chinese supported Zanla, based in Mozambique, after 1974, and they operated in the northern and eastern Rhodesia. Russians su- supported Zipra, largely based in Zambia, operated in western and southwestern Rhodesia. Of, those, of the two groups, Zanla was the most active. So, for the most part, the insurgents attacked uh, attacks concentrated on soft targets, such as rural farms, schools, mines, uh, they mined roads, and sporadic ambushes on isolated roadways um, against isolated travelers. Mm-hmm. Um, later, the attacks included um, attacks on villages that were either neutral or backing the government, and the Rhodesian security forces seemed successful to, in combating these insurgents until about December 1972. So the war intensifies in 72. The Anlin insurgents launched the third phase of the war, which begins to intensify. Um, insurgent recruitment increases dramatically. The decolonization of Mozambique in 1974 with the Portuguese uh, withdrawal, Zanla is able to open up a second front against the Rhodesian forces. Zanla is able to strike at Rhodesian targets along a 1,100-kilometer border, greatly outstretching, overstretching Rhodesian capabilities to respond. And the insurgent tactics of hit and run minimized the Rhodesian Army's conventional military encounters with the insurgents. Late in the, until late in the war, there were no conventional battles, only skirmishes and ambushes. So you have this highly sophisticated, you know, highly effective Rhodesian military force, but it's got no one to fight. They, they run into the bush. Um, by late 1974, early 75, Rhodesian intelligence and elements in the military convinced that the counterinsurgency could not be won militarily. And the adage um, that was often heard is that they were trying to empty a bathtub with a teacup with both the taps running full bore. So the Russian dilemma, uh, sorry, the Rhodesian dilemma, (laughs) sorry, the Rhodesian dilemma, Mm -hmm. um, I know we've got limited time, so I've been hurrying, Um, gave birth to uh, to efforts to attrit the insurgent forces through the use of chemical and biological warfare agents. Um, the Rhodesian intelligence had s- superb in- access to the uh, insurgents' logistics chain inside Rhodesia, and given that the insurgents were required almost constant resupply of food and beverages and clothing and medical supplies, uh, the Rhodesians could and did insert these poisoned uh, materials into the insurgent supplies. Um, so that gives you the background. So you've got you've got a, a nation state facing this insurgency and its its conventional military is poorly equipped to deal with you know guerrillas that will not stand and fight in a conventional sense. Mm-hmm. You have no battles to win. Um so you cannot win using conventional military tactics, so you turn to use of chemical and biological warfare agents to try to attrit the insurgent forces. Um, and uh, the program uh, at one point was deemed by the Rhodesians to be highly successful. They even thought uh, early on that it that could have been decisive um, you know, required constant readjustment because uh, insurgent forces would become aware of Rhodesian tactics and try to adapt and counter them. Rhodesians would have to improvise uh, new tactics uh, to circumvent uh, the insurgents' awareness of, you know, the earlier uh, threats. Um, So, interestingly... Yes. Yeah, Doctor. Let, let, let me piggyback on something I asked you a little bit ago. Uh, I, just a short answer. I said if if that, this stuff was going on today, you know, the UN or whoever would be all over it. You said, well, maybe. What, what did you mean by that? So, um, I often uh, the analogy is to the drunk man looking for his keys under the um, street lamp. Um, we know what's going on where we're looking. Um, we don't know what's going on in places we're not looking. So pick a part of the world where there seems to be little attention, little public awareness. Um, I can think of you know many places. 
you know, Latin America or Africa or other parts of the world, um, where we're not focused. You know, public attention, the attention of the press isn't there. We're focused in, on places like Syria and, and some other hot spots, mm-hmm. um, and they absorb a great deal of attention. Um, our ability to, to understand what's going on in all parts of the world is limited. We have to devote resources um, to certain areas. When we devo- devote resources to certain areas, we have to subtract resources from other areas. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> and, you know, even if there was a suspicious activity, and we can go on about this and look at bioattribution efforts uh, with the Rhodesian anthrax outbreak, but um, bioattribution efforts are notoriously difficult. And I would point to the National Academy of Sciences study on the Amerithrax case as one evidence. If you don't have some human claim or evidence of responsibility to a, uh, attributed to a human agency, a human, a human agent, then um, all the scientific uh, work uh, really doesn't get you beyond the uh, uh, into the touchdown zone. Um, you know, and again, I think the Amerithrax case is, is probably at least the NAS study is is startling evidence of that. Um, you know, their point was that the science on its own cannot tell you who who conducted the anthrax attacks of 2001. Um, so, you know, the bioattribution is a whole other thorny issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, we can talk about that if you're interested or um, there are other, you know, yeah, if you uh, wanted to talk, I want to go ahead and jump into uh, talk more about the anthrax as time is whittling away on us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm talking to Dr. Glenn Cross. His book is Dirty War, Rhodesia and the Chemical Biological Warfare, 1975 to 1980. And in the one of the ending chapters, uh, it's entitled Rhodesian Anthrax Outbreak. You write, in looking at the available clinical data, the Rhodesian anthrax epidemic of 1978 to 1980 seems to be a propagated epidemic. The data is highly consistent with a naturally occurring ec- epidemic and its propagation almost certainly due to wartime conditions. So, Dr. Cross, what happened with anthrax and Rhodesia at that time, and, and how did you come to that conclusion? Okay. Um, so, for background, uh, Anthrax is endemic in, in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and it has a long history of infecting cattle there. The uh, region has had and continues to have sporadic outbreaks of the disease. And, you know, I won't touch on the nature of the disease or its ecology because uh, Dr. Buddy uh, Ferris has already done that with you in an earlier broadcast. Yes. But in November 1978, there was an anthrax outbreak. Um, a human case was reported uh, in Lupani, which is in Matabili land. Um, now, for most of the colonial era, the Rhodesian uh, Veterinary Service had, effective, had very effectively controlled anthrax outbreaks through vaccinations and other control measures, including quarantines. Um, by 1978, though, Rhodesian security forces had, were concentrating their operations to defend other vital assets, meaning largely the European agricultural and population centers, and the rural areas were left um, either poorly defended or undefended at all. So the Rhodesian, uh, the Rhodesian Veterinary Services had no access to most parts of the rural areas of the country, and efforts by the Veterinary Services to treat animals in the rural areas uh, resulted in ambushes, so Veterinary Services uh, did not go into those areas. Um, relatively few cattle in these rural areas were vaccinated or subject to any other form of uh, disease control procedures. So with the, 1970, with the uh, November 1978 outbreak, there was the first human case reported. Now, we're not sure when the, the disease first broke out in cattle. Um, communications with these regions was, was sporadic. And ultimately, the disease affected 11,000. Uh, there were 11,000 known human cases and resulted in 182 known human deaths. The actual human and animal morbidity and mortality likely will never be known. 
Many of the afflicted likely never sought treatment or died before receiving treatment. Um, and the actual death toll likely was much higher. The actual death toll was likely much higher. The um, controversial aspect of the outbreak is its geo- geospatial spread. Um, some believe that the disease hopped in that the disease jumped from site to site inside Rhodesia, and they attribute these hops to an intentional human spread of anthracis as a biological warfare agent. The hops uh, almost certainly uh, are not due to an intentional spread of the disease by humans. Um, remember that the hops are theorized based on the number of human patients presenting at a given location. And remember that many, if not most, um, for these years, rural medical clinics were closed during to, due to the security situation and the war. And patients typically would travel hundreds of kilometers to reach an operating clinic or hospital. So concentrations at differing hospitals over a period of time are to be expected. Uh, the second explanation for the hops is that the illicit transport of anthracis contaminated meat throughout the country. The Rhodesians had restricted food supplies in rural areas to a subsistence level, intending to starve the insurgents. By restricting the food supply to the populace, the villagers were no longer free to share food with um, insurgents. And this left the rural population with little recourse but to eat and sell and three tainted beef. Now, not, the villagers are not culturally opposed to the practice of eating dropped animals, and it seems to be a standard cultural practice amongst the Bantu. So, the movement of... Hey, hey, Dr. Maybe, Cross, let, let me just interrupt you real quickly. I, I got about a minute and a half left, so we got to okay, okay. wrap it up. So, so we've got the, um, the epidemiology and the ecology of the disease point to a natural disease outbreak propagated by the collapse of the veterinary service, the deteriorating health infrastructure, the draconian food controls, and the worsening security environment. Um, so the epidemiology is consistent with a propagated natural occurrence and the ecology is consistent. The spread of the hops are, are explained. And so we've got nothing to point to a human involvement. We've got no claims or evidence of, uh, uh, responsibility on the part of humans for an intentional disease spread. Um, we've got no after the fact claims by participants for spreading the disease. No credible reports by villagers of suspicious activities that might hint at a deliberate spread. Um, in fact, we have denials of involvement by all the key Rhodesian personnel uh, who were involved in the use of chemical or biological uh, agents to a person they deny that they were involved in um, the spread of the anthrax. And that all points to a natural occurring uh, epizootic uh, that's been propagated by the deteriorating veterinary and public health infrastructure. I hope that answers your question, Robert. Is that? Yeah. I mean, we, we clearly needed more time for this interview. Uh, it's a, it's a very, uh, in-depth topic. Um, Dr. Cross, um, if someone wants to check out your book, where can they go? Amazon, the typical places? Yeah, it, it's on Amazon. It's, uh, also from, from the publisher, which is, uh, helion.co.uk. That's H-E-L-I-O-N.co.uk. Or uh, casemate.com, uh, all one word. Um, those are all good places. I wouldn't, if anyone wants any more detail on the subject, and again, it's a very detailed, very involved subject. For me personally, it's fascinating. Uh, I hope others, you know, might find it fascinating as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all in the book. I, I wish we could <laughs> have more time. Uh, I could probably have gone on for hours. But. I'm sure you could have. Um, the, the book is Dirty War, Rhodesia, and Chemical Biological Warfare, 1975 to 1980. The author is Glenn Cross. Uh, thank you, Dr. Glenn Cross, for joining me today, and congratulations on the excellent book. Thank you, Robert. It was a pleasure. You bet.